Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Hope you brought a copy of the Word of God with you today and turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 5. We are in a little mini-series on the Beatitudes and have been for a number of weeks. Really didn't know when I started that I was going to do all of them. I thought I'd just do one or two and then the Lord just kept leading. And uh, today I want to look and drill down a little bit into that sixth verse. Solomon, who was described to be the most wise man who ever lived, he starts out in his little book of Ecclesiastes and he's saying, you know, there's this emptiness in me. There's this void in me. And uh, I, I think that if I give myself to learning, if I surrender myself to becoming more educated, then somehow, some way, uh, it will meet this gnawing that I have in my life. So uh, he read every book that he could read. He went to every school he could go to, took every class that he could, got every degree that he could. And then at the end of it, he finally surmised, well, that didn't do it. Still got all of this education, but I still have this gnawing, this hurting, this emptiness, this hunger that is in my heart. So he said, well, maybe my career, if I can just set some goals and achieve those goals, if I can uh, amass this, uh, uh, an amazing professional uh, accomplishment in my life, and he did that, he became the most successful man really uh, on the planet. And uh, at the end of the day, though, he said, you know what? I look around, I'm the most popular guy in the world. I've achieved about everything that a man could achieve in his professional career and still hasn't met this need in my heart, in my life. He said, well, uh, I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to party. I'm just going to live it up. I'm just going to have a good time. I'm just going to let come uh, and go what may. And that's exactly what he did. He gave himself to wine and women and partying. And it, it was an everyday event. And then finally that didn't work. He still was just, hungry and gnawing emptiness inside of him. The other day, Kathy and I stopped at uh, uh, one of the convenience stores to buy gas, and I wanted something, and I didn't know what I wanted, and I went in. I don't know if it's a Circle K or QT. Maybe you've had one of these instances in your life. I didn't know what I wanted, and I must have spent 15 minutes going up and down every aisle in that store trying to find something that would say, ah, that's it. That, I never did figure out what, have y'all ever done that? You were just hungry for something, you just, how many of you have had, had that and never did? Now, if you didn't raise your hand, you just lied because every one of us in here, every one of us in here have had those kinds of situations. Now, I want you to watch what Jesus says in the sixth verse. He says, blessed or happy are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they will be filled. Y'all to underline or highlight that little word filled in there. Uh, powerful little word that I think is very purposefully planted there by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus said, you're going to be happy and you're going to have a satisfied life if you hunger and thirst, and then he uses this big old Bible word, righteousness. Hundreds of times you're going to find that word in the scripture. The question is, what in the world does that mean to us? What, what does righteousness mean? Uh, the, the Bible talks about the Bible itself uh, being righteous. And the Bible tells us that the foundation of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus is righteousness. He also tells us uh, in the scriptures that uh, God rewards righteousness uh, when he sees righteousness in us. The Bible tells us that Noah was a righteous man and then there's Abraham who was a righteous man and then there were the righteous brothers. No, 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 I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit mixed up here. Uh, but I can almost hear Unchained Melody about right now. Anyway, God says that one of these days he's going to judge the world in righteousness. What does that mean? 
Well, I got a couple of things I want to talk to you about this morning uh, from verse 6. Uh, we're we're going to look at, 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 at uh, God's plan. He, he's, he's got a tremendous design for us. And then I want to talk about the diet that you and I as believers are to have. But in order to get to those two things, I, we first of all got to define what righteousness really means. The first thing that you see here is that righteousness is a relationship. It means to be right with God. Right with God. Now let me help you with something because you can't do that on your own. Man cannot make himself right with God. Only God can do that. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. So Righteousness is a relationship that we are right with God. But second, righteousness is a lifestyle. Uh, it's about a position that we have with God, that we are made right with God, but it is also a practice of our everyday living. So uh, righteousness uh, is a powerful, big old Bible word and, and there are two things that I want to talk to you about. It One is, I want to talk to you about how that God makes us right with him. And then the second thing I hope to accomplish before we leave today is that how that you and I can for the rest of our life not only be made right with God, but we can have a hunger and a thirsting for righteousness that never goes away. Now, here's something that I've tried to hammer down for uh, the last few weeks. Life is not going to, are y'all listening? Say amen. amen. Life is not going to make much sense to you until you understand that you have been made by God and for God. And until you get that anchored into this, the very core of your being, life is going to be very confusing. Life's not going to make a whole lot of sense to you at all. You can go the rest of your life and you can be connected with God. That's your choice. Or you can choose to go the rest of your life and be disconnected from God. But I can assure you, if you choose to spend the rest of your life, and those of you that are watching uh, by way of live streaming and on our website, understand something. You can choose to spend the rest of your life disconnected by God, but one day you are going to stand before God and God's going to say, you didn't want to have anything to do with me while you were down here on earth. What makes you think that you could choose to spend eternity with me? It's going to happen. Uh, righteousness is the only way to live and ladies and gentlemen, it's the only way that you're ever going to spend eternity in heaven with God. All right? So let me get into the body of the message. First of all, I want to talk to you about God's design. You understand that God had to develop a plan by which he could make us righteous. He could make us right with himself. Now, you and I had a dilemma our dilemma is we can't do it. We can't make ourselves right with God. Uh, it, it is an impossibility. Uh, the Bible tells us that every one of us are imperfect. The fact of the matter is we've all blown it. We've all messed up. We've all failed in some fashion. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We don't even measure up to our own standards of living and life, much less measure up to God's standards. Jeremiah 23, 13 asks an amazing question. Can a leopard change its own spots? And the overwhelming answer is no. A leopard can't change his own spots. So imperfect man cannot make himself perfect. It is an impossibility. Now, this is very important that you get this down, get it straight, and get it plain. Why? Because heaven is a perfect place. 
It's designed for perfect people. Imperfect people cannot go into heaven and heaven remain a perfect place. Why is that? Because we'll take, we'll take our own imperfections and our own sins and our own failures and when we get to heaven, guess what? Heaven's just gonna be like earth. It won't be long until that sin will become pervasive and there'll be murders and there'll be adultery and there'll be everything else because it's inhabited by imperfect man. So uh, there's the dilemma. We cannot make ourselves perfect. Therefore, we cannot get into heaven because heaven is a perfect place. So God had to come up with this plan. He had to come up with a design. I went on visitation um, sometime back and I sat across from this man and uh, I knew before I ever got there that he had uh, never come to faith in Jesus and uh, so I went there purposefully to seek to try to lead him to Christ. And uh, I sat across from him and I called him by his name and I said, uh, uh, let's just suppose you were standing before God right now and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What do you think you would say to him? And, and he responded back, well, you know, I've kept the commandments. I said, really? You've kept all of them? He said, yes, sir, I have. I said, well, let's just think about that a minute. Let, let's talk about that for a second. Um, I said, have you ever had a lustful thought go through your mind for another woman other than your wife? And his wife was sitting there. And he, he cut his eyes. I, I noticed he had a sheepish look on his face when he looked at her, and I knew what the answer was going to be. And so he, he had enough integrity and honesty about him to say, well, yes, I, I'm, I'm sure I have. I said, well, sir, uh, according to the word of God, if you've had lust in your heart, then the Bible says that you have already committed adultery. So you've broken one of the commandments. I said, well, let me ask you another question. Have, have you ever in all of your life, have you ever hated anybody in your life? And he said, yeah, I sure have. I said, well, sir, according to the Bible, if you've had hate in your heart toward another person, then according to the word of God, you've already committed adultery. So therefore, there are two commandments that you've already been accused and guilty of, of breaking those commandments. And, and then he didn't have a leg to stand on following that. You understand, nobody has ever kept the Ten Commandments perfectly. Therefore, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one, and our righteousness is as filthy rags so God had to come up with a plan now that brings me away from our dilemma to God's deliverer um, his son Jesus Christ was the plan and is the plan and he came to pay our sin debt so that you and I could be made righteous listen to the word of God in Romans 3 I was up uh, uh, talking to one of our senior adults uh, last uh, couple of weeks and, and uh, they, they were in one of the assisted living centers and, and she was explaining to me, she said, Pastor, she said, uh, I, I've, been, um, I, I've been reading the book of Romans and it doesn't make much sense to me. I, I've read it over and over and over again and I'm having a hard time understanding it and I had a wonderful opportunity to talk to her about that. And, and here is one of those wonderful passages in that book. In Romans chapter 3, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and God's standards. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty from our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. About four days ago, my wife, through convulsive tears, she said, Mike, I just want God to bring something good from this tragedy. Talking about our grandson's death. And, and, and through my own tears back, I said, honey, he will. Just wait, God's going to do that. Yesterday as we were coming up the road, my phone rang and I looked and it was, 
Cameron's old girlfriend from out in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, she calls me Papa and she said, Papa, uh, can you tell me what John 3.16 means? She said, I have looked and seen that everywhere I've been for the last two days. Uh, she said, just a moment ago, a car passed me and, and had a bumper sticker that said, John 3.16 said, this is driving me crazy. What does this mean? And I, I said, Evelyn, um, have you ever read John 3.16? And she said, no, I haven't. She said, Papa, I haven't read the Bible very much, and I, I don't know what it means. I've never read it. I began to explain to her the meaning of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I explained that to her and I said, Evelyn, let me illustrate it for you if I could this way. Evelyn, let's suppose that you are the biggest criminal in America. You have murdered several people and you have committed adultery many times and you've been a thief all your life. And you were arrested and put on trial. And you were found guilty of the crimes that you were charged with. And the judge takes the gavel and he slams it down on the desk and he says, Evelyn, you are guilty and I am sentencing you to death. I said, Evelyn, as soon as the judge pronounced the death sentence, he gets up off the bench, disrobes, and he comes down and he stands right next to you. And he says, Evelyn, you are guilty of the charges that you have been given. And the sentence of death is yours. But Evelyn, I love you. And I'm going to set you free. And I'm going to take your place. And I'm going to die in your spot. Evelyn, that's what Jesus did for you. Yeah. Yeah. Evelyn wept and cried and prayed and received Jesus Christ into her heart and into her life. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the gospel. That is the good news. The world's religions cry out, do, do, do. But thank God, Christianity says it is done. He's taken our place. He's paid our debt. I can't make myself righteous, but the Lord Jesus Christ took my place on Calvary's cross and he says to me, Mike, you don't have to die and spend eternity in hell. I have paid your sin debt. If you will just receive me into your heart and into your life, you can spend eternity with me in heaven. That's the good news. Now that brings us to the third. We look at our dilemma we look at God's deliverer. Now it comes to our decision. What does it mean? It means I do the same thing that Evelyn did yesterday. It's I accept God's payment for my sin. And all I have to do is to realize that it is my sin that has separated me from God. Agree with him about what he says about my sin. Turn away from sin and by faith place my trust in what Jesus did for me on the cross and the empty tomb and receive him into my heart and into my life and turn from sin and to God and live for him the rest of my life. That is my choice. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you that are watching on television and the internet, for those of you that are here, it is not about a religious background. It is not about a bunch of works that people think that can make them righteous. It is simply a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 10, I was able to say, Evelyn, here is... God's word, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead, I love this next phrase, thou shalt be saved. And then he says in verse 13, 
And you can put your name in verse 13 where it says, whosoever, aren't you glad you can put your name in there? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, I love you. I love you with all of my heart. God loves you. And I want you to settle this matter of salvation. I want you to get it down. I want you to get it plain. I want you to get it straight. I don't want you to have to worry where you're going to spend eternity. I don't want you to have to labor under the guilt of the load of your own sin. Everything has already been done necessary to forgive you of that sin and to secure your place in glory. God has assured you of that. Many of you still labor under a bunch of doubts or you have really never had a moment in time in your life that you turned away from sin and placed your faith in Jesus and he dramatically saved your soul and old things passed away and everything became new and you were no longer that same person. You've never had that experience. I want you to settle that today. I want you to nail it down like many did in the earlier services. I want it to happen to you. I love you. And I don't want you to spend eternity in hell. I want you to know God's free pardon from sin. I want you to have the assurance that you're going to heaven when you die. And you can. I wonder if you would bow with me right now in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed here in this room. Also watching on on the internet. Would you just bow with me right now. And let's settle this matter of your salvation. Would you pray with me right now? I'm just going to give you the words to say, but but that won't mean a thing if you don't mean it. I want you to genuinely, sincerely, and earnestly seek God in prayer about the forgiveness of your sin. Would you do that with me right now? Would you pray right now, Heavenly Father, you can either pray it out loud or you can pray it in the confines of your own heart. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross for my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead on the third day. And I know that my sin has separated me from you. Father, please forgive me of all my sin. Right now, I willingly turn away from a life of sin. And I receive you into my heart and into my life. Holy Spirit, with your help, I'll serve the living God the rest of my life. Thank you for hearing me pray. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving my soul. Now I give you my word with every head bowed, with every eye closed, I give you my word I will not embarrass you. I will not call attention to you. I won't come back to where you are. I won't send anybody where you are. But if you prayed that prayer just then as I prayed it and you really meant it with all of your heart, I want you to hold your hand up where I can see it right now all over the building. I see several right here on my left. One, two, three, four people here. How about in the balcony? There's one in the balcony up there. There's five people Anybody else right here in the center section, if you would just lift your hand along with these others. Over here on my right, your left, there's six people. God bless you. Thank you so much. Anybody else on my right, your left? Six people. Those of you at home right now or watching uh, by way of internet or videos or television, this is the greatest decision that you've ever made in your life. May I say to you, God would never lie to you. God would never tell you anything that was untrue. And God's word says, if you will repent of your sins and receive me into your heart, I will save you. May I say to you that every sin that you've ever committed in your life now has been forgiven by the grace of God. May I say to you that you now have that relationship with God that will never be taken away And you can have the assurance that when you die now, you're going to go to heaven because God gave you his word. And I welcome you to the family of God. 
Everybody look this way just a minute. You ready? Here's B part of this message. I, I want to give you five things real quick, rapid fire. I want to give you five things now that will help you so that you won't lose the hunger and the thirst after righteousness. Got a pen? Write them down. Number one, you ready? Here we go. Every day, remind yourself that God loves you. Every day of your life, when you wake up in that morning, the first thing that ought to go through your mind is how much does God love you? You know, one of the things that, that I, I, I can assure you of, if you can ever grab hold, if you could ever grasp, if you could ever somehow come to grips with how much God really does love you. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. If you could ever grasp the depth of that love, you would never, ever have a hard time loving him back. Every day of your life, remind yourself of how much God loves you. Number two, <laughs> resist junk food. Now, we talked about God's design. We're on God, our diet now, okay? Hungering and thirsty. Resist junk food. I, I watch this all of the time. I watch this within the body of Christ. It drives me absolutely nuts at how many people do like uh, Kathy and I did a couple of nights ago. Uh, we, By the way, we're, we're beginning to be able to use all of those gift cards that you gave us for our 50th anniversary back in February and right after we got the cards, they shut all of the restaurants down. Now then they're opening back up a little bit and we're getting to use them. So we went to Carabas. You know, they have that good bread and that, that stuff you dip the bread. You, we, we, it's what we call it. Sop that bread up. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, so we sat there and that hot bread and, and that oil and seasonings and we ate. And then they brought out the appetizers to us. The, they, they brought out the salad and, and then this amazing chicken soup. And, we, and, and as soon as we got through eating that, we looked at one another and she, we, we said, I'm too full to eat now. Do, do, do you know, I, I'm watching so many people gulp down a bunch of junk food that they don't have room for the main course. I, I'm watching people feast on success and making a living, I watched the baby boomer generation, and this is my generation, and they're thinking, boy, if I can just get set for retirement, I can get my motor home, and I can drive all over America. Well, whoop de do. You're still going to be hungry. It'll never satisfy you. And I watched so many Christians spend all of their energies eating junk food, success, money, possessions, careers, hobbies, that they don't have time for the main course. May I say to you, if you really want to have a life that you hunger and thirst after righteousness for the rest of your life, resist the junk food. And then third, uh, it is reach for the goal of knowing God. Reach for the goal of knowing God. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added to you. Number four, read the word of God daily. Read the word of God daily. The Bible says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then finally, Rally with other believers. Rally with other believers. My wife and I are enjoying our teenage granddaughter. Granddaughters. We, we love them to death. And, and, and you, ever, you ever been around a bunch of teenagers? I mean, you, you, you haven't lived until you've been around a bunch of teenagers. 
And you get a bunch of them in a room and they, they, they've been tied up with maybe their grandparents for a while or whatever. And one of those teenagers will say, I'm hungry. Let's go to Cineholic over there at Sun Valley. And you know what happens after that? There'll be two or three or four more teenagers say, you know what? I've been wanting one of those Cinnabons myself. Let's just go. That sounds great. Let's do it. Uh, you understand that appetite is influenced by association. Let me say that again. Appetite is influenced by association. One of the greatest fallouts that I'm watching about COVID-19 is this. We're developing some new habits that may not necessarily be biblical. So what do you mean by that? I'm talking about social distancing. I'm not talking about the six feet thing. I'm talking about the fact that uh, maybe we are not as hungry and thirsty that we once were about getting back together with the people of God. All across America, do you know what the numbers are right now? All across America, less than 50% have returned to church. All across America, less than 50% of the people that were coming before COVID are now returning. You know, I thank God that we have the ability to communicate the gospel through the internet. I thank God that we have the ability to communicate the gospel through television and other outlets like that because it's enabled us to keep projecting the word of God to our community and to our world. I'm grateful for that. But I can also tell you that the word of God says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Ex here's the key word, exhorting one another. That's the whole purpose. You, you know, we are influencing by association. And one of the things that's happened in the last 37 years, the very glue that has kept this ministry together and flourishing and growing is our small groups. And we need each other. And I thank God, ladies and gentlemen, for this church that's coming back together and keep coming back together. We need each other. By the way, we need to get our kids back in school too. They, they, we, we need the word of God. We need that influence. Proverbs chapter two says, hang in with people who will help keep you on the path of the righteous. Huh. We need each other. Let me say it again. We need each other. Well, that's a little bit better, but we need each other. Thank God for you. In just a minute, uh, Matthew's going to come and lead us in a time of invitation. And there were at least six of you that raised your hand a few minutes ago, said you prayed that prayer with me. And I want all six of you to come and I want you to join me here at the front, okay? I want to pray with you. I want to pray over you. I want to pray for you before we leave today. And by coming, you're, you're, here's what the deal is. By coming, you're saying to the world, today, I've been made right with God. Today, Jesus became my Lord and my Savior. Today, I am not ashamed to take my stand for Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you to come. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to say anything. I'm not going to put a microphone under your lips. I'm not going to do any of that. I just want to pray for you before you go home. There are many of you that need to come, and you need to pray for our country you need to pray for our nation. We need, you need to pray for our leaders. You need to pray that the body of Christ can come back together again and that we become who God wants us to be. And maybe you kind of somewhere along the way lost your hunger and thirst for God. Maybe you waned a little bit and there's some things that you need to adjust in your life. I invite you to come and just tell the Lord about it. Commit to getting back so that that hunger could be restored, so that you could hunger and thirst for the rest of your life.
Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.